Hey everyone! Today I would like to tell you a little bit about the German language. I found this book called The TV Atlas Deutsche Sprache And it starts off with this really interesting map here of all the German-speaking regions. So you have Germany, Switzerland and Austria. And it reads just the different words for girl. You might know the standard German word, which is Mädchen. But you see that there are many, many different varieties, both in the pronunciation of Mädchen, which might be Nieken, Madla, Mädel, Mädli, Mädchi. But then there's also this word here, Dindl, which you would find here in the south. Here's a bit of an old one, Minch or Mincha, which is the same word as for person or human. Here in the north you also have Dian, Dian. And a bit of an odd one here on the border to the Netherlands, Wicht. That's pretty funny, it's like no. <laughs> so, there are many, many different maps in there. Um, some of these are for standard words, so that you would use in a written text. Some of these are for dialect expressions. Um, some are quite old at this point and not in use anymore. For example, the words for the days of the week, which we can have a look at later on. But I think first of all, we should have a look at this German-speaking area in general. So, this looks a little complicated. You might be able to tell you don't just have Germany, Switzerland and Austria here, but that there are also regions in the east Here, for example, in Poland, where today, as far as I know, German is not spoken anymore. You also have the Dutch and Belgian regions featured here, and the Niederfränkisch, and a lot of these small areas that I've already mentioned in my video about uh, Austria Hungary, where you had quite a lot of sort of German islands in the eastern parts of the Habsburg Empire, like down here in the Banat. Alright, then we have these two big lines, one in the north and one in the south, that separate a southern, a central and a northern part. These are dialect regions. Lower German, Central German, and Upper German. But we're going to talk about that in a couple moments. Um, personally, I'm from down here. And uh, even here in Austria, people sometimes think that Austrian German is the same as Austrian dialect. But that's not quite true. In fact, you have three different standard versions of German. Let me get a different map. So, generally we speak of German as a pluricentric language, meaning it has a number of um, centers where you have fully formed standard language. You have the 
German of the German Republic which is by far the biggest area, of course, with about 80 million people. So, um, it makes sense, of course, that most people, when they learn German, they learn this variety, because it's the, the one that is spoken most often. Then here in blue, you would have the Austrian standard variety. Okay, this is just a lake here. <laughs> Which has its own dictionary, um, basically its own pronunciation, mostly differences in terms of vocabulary, which is quite interesting because I remember when uh, Austria joined the European Union in the 90s, that was a really, really big topic. A lot of the standard vocabulary that we have here in Austria, which is different to the one in Germany, has to do with food, with cooking, uh, with different kinds of preparations. And <laughs> I think people were really worried that we would have to say Quark, for example, instead of Topfen. I'm going to show you some examples in a moment. But first, let's have a look at the third standard variety, which is here in Switzerland. This is, of course, not all of Switzerland. It has four different standard languages as a country, and one of them being German. Again, its own variety with its own rules, its own vocabulary. So these three standard versions are basically pretty similar. If you've learned one, you probably understand the other ones too. But um, if you write for a newspaper, for example, if you publish any texts in one of these countries, you want to make sure that the, you use the correct variety. Then you also have these small areas here. So this one would be in light blue. This is part of Italy. This is Sud Tyrol, so the southern part of the Tyrol, which would be the Bundesland right here. This is part of Italy and mostly uses the Austrian variety, but also has some differences. There's, uh, I think, a lot of translations from Italian. Here you have Liechtenstein, which is its own country. So we see here that it's listed under the Swiss variety. So probably a lot of similarities here. I have to admit, I'm not really familiar with Liechtenstein German. Then here we have Luxembourg, which is listed under the German variety. Letzebürgerisch, uh, I think it's called. And it's quite closely related to the dialect spoken here in this area. And Belgium also has a small area along the border to Germany and Luxembourg with a German-speaking population. So, that's the one part. Three standard varieties that are all equal to each other. And for Austrian German, I just quickly want to show you one example. You might remember this book here from a previous video I've done, Österreich Vegetarisch. This has a lot of Austrian recipes, um, many of them traditional, all vegetarian, which is quite unusual. But what you would often find in cookbooks from Austria is a list here at the end. Let's see, where is it? Right here. Okay. 
which is called Küchenösterreichisch and you would have things like Bröseltopfen which is translated as Quark mit sehr niedrigem Wassergehalt you would have a Dampfel a Dotter Eierschwammer so this would be uh, mushrooms in German they're called Pfifferlinge potatoes in Germany are called Kartoffeln in Austria you would both use Kartoffeln but I'll also say things like Erdäpfel Fisuren, Fleckerl Gerissen, Gern, etc. So there's quite a lot of expressions that are typical for Austria and one of the really important ones here is Marillen which is Austrian for Aprikosen you probably know what this is Aprikos and um, when Austria joined the European Union that was one of the words that people were really worried about and newspapers were writing about the Marillenkrieger, so the Africa Wars so there was quite a heated discussion at the time and I think it gives, a, it gives us an idea of how much of an emotional topic language can be right, but let's put this book aside again we don't want to talk about cooking today okay, so if we compare these two maps we see that they don't really correspond so the standard varieties that you have don't correspond with these dialect families let me give you some examples so I would speak like I live in Austria, here in Vienna but the dialect I speak is called Bayerisch-Österreichisch so Bavarian Austrian um, I think in older texts it's sometimes also only called Bavarian so you could say I speak Bavarian but I live in Austria but then people who might live here in this region they would speak Frankish for example here in Nuremberg but um, this area, Frankenland, is part of Bavaria so they live in Bavaria but they speak a different dialect which is Frankish and then of course here Alemannisch crosses numerous borders you would speak it in Switzerland in the south of Germany and also in the westernmost part of Austria so Alemannisch is spoken in three different countries let's have a closer look at these different dialect families so I can link to these maps, I think they're really interesting and you can just find them on Wikipedia basically here you have the upper German dialects which sometimes go all the way up to here depending on how you want to classify them here you have the central German dialects in the north you have the lower German dialects and here we also have the Dutch dialects included and Frisian I'd say let's start in the north so interestingly the Germanic tribes initially settled in this region here up in the north 
and um, one of the big changes in language that kind of differentiated all the Germanic languages from the other Indo-European languages that are related to the Germanic languages happened while the Germanic tribes were still up here so in the first millennia BC probably was finished around 500 BC the Germanic tribes then moved south they also moved north and of course to the west especially here from the north the Angles and Saxons and um, one of the languages most closely related to the language of the Angles and the Saxons is this language here, Frisian um, I have had the pleasure to hear a speech in Frisian once on an island here in the north but I have to admit I didn't understand anything um, the Germans spoken up here and the dialects feel quite far away from the German spoken down here so Frisian, um, I'm not sure whether it's actually classified as a separate language or as a German dialect of course that's also always a matter of opinion but this really feels quite far away and in fact Frisian itself is also differentiated into West Frisian, East Frisian and North Frisian then let's see the Low German dialects we have Low Saxon number one here would be Slesbikian number two would be Holsatian number three, quite a big area would be North Low Saxon four would be Groning's East Frisian so there might be some similarities here oh, sorry, here between Frisian and Low Saxon five, let's see where's five okay, so this is over here probably, both areas then five here would be Dutch Low Saxon six would be Westphalian and seven Eastphalian okay so that's this area here then we also have East Low German with Pomeranian nine would be North Margravian and ten separated into two islands here on both sides of Berlin would be Central Margravian so up here in the north um, the dialect is also often called Plattdeutsch or Plattdeutsch and this was a really important dialect uh, during the Hanseatic area it was the lingua franca of the region, meaning that if the ship sailed here, for example from Hamburg to the east or to the north people would speak different languages, but they all knew a little bit of Low German and that's how they could communicate with each other and that's also how some Low German words made their way to Scandinavia, for example there's a word for speaking, uh, schnacken which is the Norwegian word for speaking snacke so um, there's a lot of similarities today uh, lower German is not used very often people here in the north mostly speak standard German let's move on to central German so basically it's the area in the middle we start off around Köln with Ripoarian 
17 would be Moselle Franconian and 18 would be Luxembourgish, so like I just mentioned, very closely related to this language family here. Then 19 is Hessian, 20 Rhine Franconian and 21. Here we are across the border in France is Lorrainian Franconian. Further in the east we have Thuringian, Upper Saxon, the Berlin dialect and Lower Silesian. Now this area is probably the area that is uh, the most easy to understand if you learn German as a foreign language. Um, a lot of standard German is based on this area here, so I think especially the eastern part. Um, a lot of the words have been used from here. I think generally it's a mix of different uh, dialects, but this definitely was the most influential area. The biggest part, however, is the upper German part. And here we can differentiate, first of all, into East Franconian and South Franconian. Then we have West Upper German. Here we have Swabian, Low Alemannic. Alsatian, again across the border in France. We have High Alemannic in Switzerland and also in Switzerland, Highest Alemannic. And you see that it also includes the westernmost part of Austria in Liechtenstein. And then we have East Upper German with North Bavarian. Here Nuremberg lies in the Bavarian area, not in the Franconian one. We have Central Bavarian, which includes the entire region from Vienna to Munich. And we have Southern Bavarian, so basically south of the Danube here, through the Alps towards Italy and Slovenia. Now you might wonder how come German has these three big dialect families and they are partly really very very different. Um, if I hear someone speak Plattdeutsch I probably won't be able to understand them. I have a very hard time understanding full Swiss and I think it probably goes the other way around too, so people from Germany having a very hard time with Austrian German or Swiss dialect. Now, one reason of course for these big differences is political. Um, the German speaking areas for a long time were differentiated into smaller um, kingdoms, etc. So they also developed in different ways. One other reason, however, is the uh, second German consonant shift, which started here in the south and moved northwards. It is fully realized in the upper German areas, partly realized in the central areas and not realized in the north. And we can have a look at that here. So the, these two big lines that I mentioned earlier, the southern one is called the Speira Linie and it tells us how this line was drawn. To the south of this line you would say 
Apfel, but north of the line you would say Apfel means apple. So you see that in the north this is quite similar to English, but in the southern variant this double P was changed to PF, Apfel. And then here the northern line that separates central from lower German. This one's called Benrathe Linie. And here we have another two examples. In the south you would say Ich for I. In the north you would say Ich. And the same with the word for to make. In the south you say machen. And in the north, machen. So again, closer to English. So you can tell these changes that originated from the south happened later when English or also the Scandinavian versions had already been differentiated from German. They kept these versions, machen. Apple, but in the south you would say Apfel or Machen. I think it's some really interesting details here. But of course here again we are in the area of dialect. This is how people would um, well, mostly speak at home, not always. The way dialects are used differs quite a lot depending on where you are. So here we have another map for that. We can see the area where dialect is used the most often or where people feel like they have very good knowledge of dialect with between 81 to 90 percent is here in Switzerland. And in fact, in Switzerland, people really do use a lot of dialect. You will also hear it on TV, so it's quite common to just speak in dialect. In the other southern regions here, Rheinland-Pfalz, Saarland, Baden-Württemberg, Bayern, and Österreich. You also have a very high knowledge of dialect, between 71 to 80 percent. So then here in Austria, the uh, situation is a little different in that you would use a lot of standard language, but people also speak a lot of dialect. And uh, it's a bit more of a sort of a sliding scale and people would use more dialect or more standard language depending on the situation and depending on who they talk to whether it's family, whether it's their boss or their colleagues um, whether it's an official situation or a private party maybe so you can hear a lot of different versions you know, where standard language and dialect are mixed but I think nowadays um, the way people speak is more something called Umgangssprache so it's not full dialect but already much closer to standard language in terms of vocabulary and pronunciation in Germany, from what I know, dialect is something that you would really mostly use in private settings and not at all in public and you can see that especially here in Niedersachsen and Brandenburg there's very very little knowledge of dialect left and especially the northern dialect, so Plattdeutsch um, are almost endangered by now so people try to revive them nowadays because of course it was a really big language and it'd be a shame if it died out All right, now how about we look at some examples? So, this one I've already mentioned, the words for speaking. You 
can see that here in the self, people would use reden. Then here's a little corner where people would say schwätzen or schwatzen. In the north, people would mostly use sprechen or over here kosen. And here in the area, people would say schnacken, the word I've already mentioned. And there are even more varieties when we come to the word for hurrying. So the standard German would be sich beeilen, to hurry, which we can only see here in this little corner. Here people say sich beeilen. Here's a somewhat different pronunciation, sich beeilen. And this one's just a little shorter, sich eilen. But in the south, a lot of people would say sich tummeln. Also here and in this Alemannic region. Here in Switzerland and parts of Germany, you would say pressieren, which might be derived from French, I guess. You would have a sich sputen. So I think this is also made it into standard German. I'm definitely familiar with this one, but I've never heard of hinmacken, hille, hiltumacken, taumacken, tumacken, wackerwies, streben. Okay, I know this one, but of course in a different um, meaning. Furtmocken, gau anmocken, gave mocken. So lots and lots and lots of different expressions. The same is true if you want to say this year. In Austria, you would say heuer for this year. Obviously, also in parts of Germany within the southeastern part, but in the northwestern part you would say dieses Jahr in well, whichever pronunciation you would have. And for potatoes from this year you would also use heurige, so based on heuer. Heurige means potatoes from this year, which might be exclusive to Austria. Um, pretty sure it's not used in Germany. And here we have the days of the week. We have Saturday, which in the south would be Samstag, but in the north would often be called Sonnabend, so the evening before a Sunday. And then here we have the words for Tuesday. Basically, um, anywhere you go, people will say Dienstag, but historically in dialect, you also had the word Erdtag. I know my great-grandmother knew this word, I don't know if she really used it. Erdtag, that's also Dienstag. And a bit of a curiosity, in the area around Augsburg, it was called Aftermontag. So after Monday. And it says here that Erdtag or Zichtag was based on a Germanic god. And the uh, Bistum, so the Bishop of Augsburg, didn't like that. So he tried to erase it by using after Montag. It's really quite curious. We also usually have Mittwoch, but in one of the northwestern areas, people would say Wodanestag or Wünstag, based on Wodan, so again a Germanic god. 
And for Thursday, Donnerstag, you would have the variant Pinstag or Pinkstag. So this doesn't have anything to do with Pinkston, Pentecost, but it derives from the same word, namely Greek, for fifth. Um, it's obvious in the English word for it, Pentecost, Pentecost, which would be the 50th day after Easter. And Pinkster would be the 5th day of the week. Some words are both used differently in dialect and in standard language like Spengler and Klempner. We've already had Adapfrüh and Kartoffeln for potatoes. There are many, many, many other versions like Erdbeere, so a ground pear, Grumbeere, which probably is related to ground pear, might also be ground berry, Heppere, uh, Herdäpfrüh, Erdbeere, Erdbeere. And these are shortened forms of Kartoffel, I think, like Tüffel, Tüffel, Tüffke, Kartoffel, Tüffel. In the north we also have Schlucke, oh, sorry, Schucke or Erdschucke. And very funny here in this area, they would say Noodle. I don't know how that's happened, but it's amused me quite a lot. I'm wondering whether that's still in use. And some words for vegetables. Tomato is generally a tomato, but in Austria, um, I think mostly in Vienna, you might also hear Paradiser. Personally, I've never used Paradiser until I've moved to Vienna, so that might be regional. I'm sure it's not used as often anymore as indicated here. For mushrooms, we have the standard German Pilz, but in Austria we would use Schwammel. So that's definitely something different. You see there are many many different versions of this. In some areas you would simply use champignon. Here too, there's also kocher, hüttefleisch, patten or pachen, ütchenstahl, pockenstahl, borken, krötenstuhl. And now here we have pilzke. Pelz, Schwung. For Gurke, cucumbers, we have a lot of different pronunciations of Gurke from Jurke, York, Gurk, Gurke, Gurke. We also have a Kimmerling, Kurkumma, and Murken or Umurken. I have heard Umurken, but once in my life, so that's definitely gone out of fashion. And people would just simply say Gurke. But you can tell Germans are a little complicated all in all. There's, of course, a rich history and a very long history. But I think the most important fact to remember is that you have these three standard German varieties on the one hand and then you have three dialect families on the other hand that do not correspond. But I think these many many differences 
I also got mixed German, which is a really interesting language and if you ever have a chance to kind of dig into dialect, either in German or maybe also in your own language, definitely do it. It's really interesting and usually quite funny. Alright, so I think that's quite a lot of information. I will link these two maps if you want to have a closer look. And um, for now, thank you for watching and I hope you'll join me again next time.